Hey, I'm John. I've got my partner Aaron up in the bow. We're doing a little fishing here on Lake Superior. Today I'm going to be discussing well, everything I've learned over the years of backcountry fishing from a canoe. And this is part of the Boundary Waters Expo 2020, which unfortunately, for obvious reasons, can't be conducted in person this year. So we're doing the next best thing and taking it online. I'm going to be talking about six topics in this video. And if I start blabbing about something that you couldn't care less about, <coughs> Pinching barbs. <clears throat> Who said that? I gotta talk to Quinn about the security at this event next year. Um, yeah, and I wanna thank Quinn for, for the invite to participate as a presenter in this expo. Uh, yeah, so if, if you don't wanna hear about one topic, I'll put the time to each one below so that you can skip ahead and get to uh, something that interests you. I'm gonna start off the video with my number one tip for catching more fish on your backcountry trips. I'll also be talking about what happens if you hook yourself in the backcountry. I'll go over my favorite fishing rod and, and rig overall with reel, line, tackle. Uh, and then my favorite lures, if I had to pick five, these would be it. Gathering intel and pre-trip research that'll help you catch more fish when you're going into lakes you don't know. And then finally, a, a subject that is very dear to my heart. It won't help you catch more fish, but it might help the next person. And one last thing before I start, if you go to the Boundary Waters Expo Facebook page, which I'll, I'll also link to in the description, you can go see other videos from the other presenters from this event. So without further ado, I'll tell you right now, the number one thing that catches half of my fish. So on a, any given trip, this doubles the number of fish that I catch. It's very easy, very fun, and it really breaks up your day of paddling as well. And that tip is to strategically troll. Trolling is so effective, you're keeping your line in the water for one. It's probably multiplying the amount of time your line is in the water on a trip if you're otherwise just casting by 10. So you're, you're getting just so much more opportunity statistically to catch fish. But it's not about just taking your rod and you know jamming it under your leg. We've all done that, we all do it sometimes. Or into your gear. It's about a rod holder. So I'll show you that now. This particular trolling mount comes in two pieces. It's got one which is actual, the actual rod holder, which can accommodate a bait caster. That's why it's cupped here. And then the gunnel mounting clamp. It goes on very easily, just like slow. And you just twist it on to close the clamp and that's it. Some fish like to follow for, for quite a while before they hit, so often the distance you're casting isn't going to give them enough time to follow before they get back and see the boat and scoot off. Another beautiful part of it is it's keeping your lure in the strike zone. If you use a crankbait, let's say, that dives to a certain depth, and that depth is where you're trying to find that species that you're fishing for based on the time of year, you're going to keep your lure there for long periods, which is going to give you so much more time to intercept fish compared to if you're just casting, you're briefly in the strike zone, and then you're lifting up and back to the canoe. And there are various ways you can keep your lure in the strike zone at a certain depth. You can try and use a three-way swivel, a dipsy diver. Downriggers are, of course, not, not really practical for a canoe. I have seen it, though. Uh, but uh, how I do it is just crankbaits with varying running depths. So the bigger the lip, generally, uh, this part here, the deeper it's going to run, so I'll be trolling different things such as this, which will run shallow with a small lip. Oh. Something like this, which runs a little deeper, take it a little deeper even still. Or if I want to get as deep as possible, I'll use a crankbait with a big lip like this. So you can run anywhere from, from surface to 20 feet down with these lures, which can often be sufficient for almost any species, even lake trout. I've, I've caught lake trout trolling shallow lures actually in the summer, but often I'll go with a deeper one and you can still run into them there. And you're getting closer to the thermocline, which can be essential in, in certain lakes in the summer and for certain species. And because it's a clamp design, it can fit on just about any canoe, as long as your gunnels aren't five inches wide, which I can't imagine they are. 
One big reason why this is superior to just wedging the, the rod in between your legs is that it keeps the rod in play. You know, this this will flex perfectly and the and the action of the rod can come into play and be used. It's also in front of you and you can see it. You can see keep an eye on your rod tip and see if uh, it gets knocked or if it has picked up weeds. Trolling from the canoe also creates a variety of actions on your lure, which I'll discuss here in this trip from last year. In a situation like this where I'm just trolling, I'm not trying to get anywhere, I don't use correction strokes, I just paddle on one side until I get turned about 15 to 20 degrees in one, one side of the canoe. Then I'll switch and just do the same until I get 15 to 20 degrees on that side. And what that does is creates inside and outside turns for my lure. So it goes faster or slower and changes direction at various points throughout my paddle. Those changes in speed and direction can be what triggers the strike. There's one right now. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> just a small pike. And overall, trolling is just a lot of fun because it, on a long day of paddling, it, it breaks up your day. You get a fish here, a fish there, and you're always kind of excited by the possibility of that happening as you're paddling along. So if you tend to leave your trips feeling like you could have caught more fish or you didn't get enough time to fish, I really highly, highly recommend fishing using this rod holder. Next topic I'm going to talk about is what happens if you hook yourself in the backcountry. This could be a really ugly scenario. It happened to me last year on a trip with Aaron on the Steel River and it wasn't fun but it could have been a lot worse. I'll take you back to that clip now. I just yanked my lure out of the water and it went into my leg. Oh it's in good. Oh this is gonna suck. Oh. Man, I better just do it. This is gonna get worse. Oh, crap! Oh, it's in good. Evidently, this one was not a pinched barb. Oh. Oh. Last summer, Aaron and I were on a canoe trip on the Steel River in relative wilderness, away from any medical help or hospitals or anything like that when I pretty deeply hooked my right thigh with a thick hook similar to this one. It was quite a miserable experience to rip it out, but ultimately I was glad for the experience and I'm going to explain why in this video. If you've never pinched your barbs before, here's a pretty large hook again with a big barb so you can hopefully see it. All you do is take pliers and crush it down like so. Often you'll hear a snap like that. Here's a good example of what it should look like when it's done. You can see the barb is crushed right into the shank flush and I can run my finger over it smoothly. So as a result it was very unpleasant to dig out of my leg. I'll show you a quick clip of what that looked like right now. Oh man. Easier if I do it? No. Okay. I thought I pinched all my barbs. Oh man. Makes me feel a little squeamish. Mind over matter. Holy crap, he is really not wanting to budge. I know you're supposed to push down to try and release the bar. Oh, oh, oh. Get it? oh, yeah. It's for you. Thanks. Oh, oh, that's not pleasant. And I'll put the rest of that footage at the end of the video if you want to see more of it. At the time, I was just reeling back the lure really fast to the canoe and pulling up on my rod to try and uh, get it over a shallow section. And then suddenly, before I knew it, before I could react at all, it had launched out of the water and flew just uh, grazed my leg enough that the hook caught and went in deep but uh, yeah I had, there was no time to react that could have gone anywhere it could have gone around my face it could have gotten me an eyeball which would have been grotesque like I can't even imagine that scenario in the back country especially and uh, and in worse it could have it could have hit Aaron and hooked her like that would just be the worst feeling in the world good timing buddy 
Pets are another great reason to pinch your barbs. If you hooked your dog on a backcountry canoe trip, um, you can only imagine how that could go. And uh, I see it being pretty ugly, especially if it was around the face. I can see the dog going into to panic or just, you know, at the very least being in terrible pain. So uh, if, you're, if you've got dogs on canoe trips or where you're fishing, I think it's a, it's a really good idea. If you fish with children at all, that's another great reason to do this. You'll know if you've had that experience that kids don't have very good control of their lure and often it's extremely frustrating to fish with them because they just get it messed up and everything. But someday that could be you. And I know the first thing that people think of when they think about pinching their barbs is, oh, I'm going to lose fish. Well, you don't need barbs to, to hook things. This is a piece of wood. All it takes is tension. And that depends on your skill as an angler. If you want it to be a real sport, barbless really enhances that because you need skill. You have to learn how to angle and keep tension on the line. As soon as I lose tension, it falls right out, of course. But, I mean, if it can stay in a piece of wood with tension, it can certainly stay in a fish's mouth with tension. So in the end, I'm really glad that I did hook myself so I could get that experience and learn that lesson in a non-horrific way. It could have been a lot worse. And now, hopefully that will never happen to me again, at least with a barbed hook. But it also gave me a new appreciation for what fish go through. I realize this discussion is a little bit different for anglers who only fish for sustenance and not for sport, because they're not planning to release a fish again. That's, that's fine, but if you are practicing catch and release, a barbless hook is really essential to that. Not only for the lack of damage that you cause in the mouth, but for the speed with which you can get it back into the water, which is essential to catch and release. You have to get them back very, very quickly. 15 seconds is a good target. So in my case, the hook was buried down into my thigh. So I couldn't, a lot of people said, why don't you just push it through? So if it had just gone through my fingertip, let's say, which actually happened to me this past winter, you can just push it through, pinch the barb, and then pull it back out. That wasn't possible. It was buried this way. If I had pushed it around, it would have been a bloodbath. But there is a method, uh, it's called like the line loop method, where you essentially wrap braided line or something, a line that's very strong that isn't going to break. Braid is quite strong for its diameter. Um, around the shank of the hook and rip it out just like real quick and it does it cleanly. You might bleed a bit still, but um, that is a good method, which I had ironically studied years before this incident and had completely forgotten in the moment, so I ended up ripping it out the, the ugly way. I'm sure there may be other considerations for you and your situation, and uh, if you'd like to tell me about that, I'd welcome your, your feedback in the comments. But otherwise, if you, if you don't have a real objection to anything I've said so far, I recommend putting on a pair of safety glasses, and the next time you're watching TV, go and clip them if you're sitting there, you got nothing else to do. And that's it. I'll leave it at that and I'll show you the rest of that footage now. So uh, hopefully you can learn the easy way. Oh, oh, that's not pleasant. That's never happened to me before. Oh man. I'm seeing stars. Luckily it's not bleeding too much. Oh starting to feel better. It just took like five minutes of, uh, of feeling like I was going to faint. Ripping a hook out of yourself isn't fun. I didn't do a good job of pinching this barb, so there's a little bit left to it. I'm a real proponent of, of uh, pinching barbs for fish's sake, especially if you're a catch and release angler. I'm After this trip, or maybe even tonight, uh, I'm going through all my lures and getting every last bit of barb off. That's, uh, that is really unpleasant. I don't want to do that to a fish. If the barbs had been pinched on that, that would have come out like nothing. This is your favorite iron chest. You go first. <laughs> the next subject I'll talk about is lure selection. You can't bring like 10 of these like you could in your, your bass boat if you have one. You want to pack pretty light for a backcountry trip. So, if I had to narrow it down to five lures based on some important criteria that I'll discuss, these would be it. 
When I was younger, I used to think that the more lures I had in my tackle box, the more fish I would catch. And now as I get older and older, I want fewer and fewer lures in my tackle box. Sometimes I get to thinking, what if I boiled it down to just my top 20 lures or 10 or five and really pack light for a backcountry trip? Well, if I absolutely had to pick five, these would be it. Really the decision boils down to three questions. How deep do you want to fish? How quickly do you want to fish your lure? and what size or profile of bait do you want to use. With my five lures, I want to be able to cast, troll, and jig effectively. So without further ado, here is lure number one. A simple jig and a soft plastic. I especially like spin jigs. They have this little spoon tethered on there with a the split ring, and that really gives it a lot of extra life. Your line connects to the jig head on the top, which allows you to jig it or cast it effectively. I really like this particular paddle tail. It's about two inches long, a bit translucent. You can see through it a bit. Uh, and then it's a bit iridescent as well. It's got like a little rainbow pattern to it, kind of like an oil slick. A uh, very natural bait fish looking pattern. Second pick is a spoon. I really like the little Cleo. If I had to pick one, I guess it would be the little Cleo. This is a 2 -fifth ounce, half silver, half green. Color matters so much less than the other three variables you're dealing with, which are speed, depth, and size. I just like green, and some old timer told me uh, at the start of a backcountry trip that this was a really good one, so I'm going with it. Similar to the first lure, this can be jigged vertically and casted very effectively. The 2 -fifth ounce allows you to bomb it pretty well. Third lure is a lipless crankbait. These things are great because you can cast them really far. They're heavier ones anyway. And they've almost always got a rattle in them nowadays, which makes them uh, very easy for fish to detect. I really like these for lake trout in particular in summer or winter. Uh, you just let it fall deep and then rip jig it back to the surface. It's quite effective for lakers. So this is a great lure for jigging and for casting, but what about trolling, which is increasingly a big part of my fishing approach. My fourth pick is a larger minnow bait or a jerk bait. Anything of this style will do. It doesn't run very deep, so it's great for shallow trolling. This one is about four inches long. Again, it's got that iridescence to it. It's got that bit of a rainbow, which really mimics a lot of bait fish. And in addition to being great for trolling, I love casting it too. Fifth and final pick is a mid-depth crankbait. Something that runs at least 12 feet deep and as much as 20 or even 25 feet. This one's a Berkley Flicker Minnow 9D, and it runs about 15 feet. Of course, it depends on how much line you have out and what speed you're trolling at. The important thing with this pick is that it gets me within striking distance of the thermocline, and in the summer that can be super important. I'm not necessarily going to be in the thermocline, but if there's a fish hanging out there, I'm just putting it on a tee for it to come up and smash it. So those are my five, and I bet there are a few people out there who are just screaming, what about this lure? Are you crazy? Something like this, an inline spinner, it's tough to make the cut. Uh, I'd love to hear what uh, five you would pick, or if you think I have any glaring omissions, what that one would be for you. So let me know your feedback in the comments below. Similar to cutting down the number of lures you bring on a trip, you probably don't want to bring a ton of rods. Again, you're not in a bass boat, you can't just throw them all in a rod locker and and have them out of the way, not to mention you have to portage them. So you might want to narrow it down to one. I used, to, when I started out backcountry camping, I used to bring three rods typically, often a bait caster for, for casting, um, a spinning reel for trolling and casting, and then a lighter spinning setup for drop shots and things like that. But now I've narrowed it down to one to accomplish jigging, casting, and trolling. It's not perfect at any of them, but it is excellent uh, for, for all purposes. So I'll show you that clip now. I want to take you through my favorite fishing rig from spool to snap. I'm going to briefly go over my reel, rod, uh, what line I use, mono, braid, or fluorocarbon. It's a trick question. Uh, terminal tackle and knots. Not all that long ago, I used to change this configuration pretty regularly. Uh, maybe once or twice a year, I'd, I'd discover some improvement, but I haven't changed it in a few years, so I feel like I've landed on a keeper here. Let's start out with the reel. This is the Fluger Supreme 35. Uh, it's an excellent rod for your money. Uh, fishing is my life, but I'm still very frugal. I want good quality, but not for top dollar. There are seven, eight hundred dollar reels plus out there. I'm not in the market for that. I'm a value shopper. Um, this one runs, I think, 130 or 140 Canadian, and it was worth every penny. I've banged it up. Like, just look at it. It's all dinged up, scratched up, uh, dragged it into trees. 
on the portages and it's been through a lot. Uh, it's no worse for wear. It's as smooth as the day I got it with very little maintenance. I oil and grease it sometimes, maybe once a year at the most. I also have the Fluger Supreme in a bait caster and then the Fluger President is my backup spinning reel. I've tried plenty of brands uh, and settled on Fluger. I'm really happy and satisfied with the quality for the money. Another product I love for the money is the Ugly Stick Elite. Uh, this is a seven foot, one piece rod. Two piece is fine too. One piece gives you a bit more sensitivity. Um, if you look at tournament anglers, I don't think any of them are using two piece rods, but uh, for you and I, it's it's absolutely fine. So rods have a couple of primary properties, which is the action, meaning where in the rod it bends. If it bends mostly at the tip, it's a fast action rod. If it bends much closer down to the shaft, then it's a slow action rod. This one is more so in the middle, which I like. It's kind of like an all-in-one. I use it for trolling a lot, so I want some give for a nice smooth hook set, uh, but I don't want it to be too soft so that I can't hook set when I'm casting effectively. So the second major property of a rod is its power. So can it deal with uh, big heavy fish or only with small panfish for instance. This one is a, a medium power rod so again it's kind of just the sweet spot. In the backcountry I can't have, I don't have a rod locker in a 17 foot boat with six rods in it. Um, I can carry one maybe two. So I need one, a rod that's going to do everything for me. So. For that, I go for medium action, medium power. I like a cork handle as well, it's just more comfortable. This is not high quality cork, so it's chipping away, but it's still fine. So let's talk about the line now. On the back end, I've got my least favorite line, which is monofilament. This is, I think, 12 pound. Um, it is just my backing for my braid. With most reels, you can't tie braid directly to the spool. It'll slip. I actually returned uh, when I was uh, just getting into braid, I returned a reel. I think it was a Daiwa reel from Walmart. Sorry, Walmart. Um, I returned it because I thought the reel was defective, but it was just the braid slipping on the spool. So if you put mono on the back, uh, it'll stop it from slipping and it saves you money because mono is so cheap. Braid is much more expensive. You can fill in some of your reel with mono, which is much cheaper. Many years ago I used to tie my line on with all kinds of ridiculous uh, knots that I invented until I discovered that, oh, there is a perfect knot uh, called the arbor knot for attaching line to your spool. All it requires is an overhand knot which you slip over the spool and then another overhand knot tied on the end which you pull through. Go look up a video on it, it's super easy. Now I'm going to reel this back on. So to attach the mono backing to the uh, 30 pound braid that I like, I use a double uni knot and you want that double uni knot to be as small as possible. Uh, and you will need to cut the tag ends of your knots as close to the knot as possible. If the tag ends are loose or if the knot is too big, as you're casting, your line is gonna catch on it as the line is pulling out and it's gonna inhibit your cast. So it's a really important part of the setup. I switched to braided line a few years ago and I don't think that I'll ever go back. I just love the lack of memory to it, you know, there's no coil as opposed to this uh, mono which is already kind of annoying me and coiling up on itself. And there are things you can do to try and minimize that but I think braid is just a, a far superior option. And then of course the great thing about braid is it has it's no stretch as opposed to the mono which stretches a bit. Stretch can be good depending on what you're doing but by and large, I would way rather have this not stretching and being able to feel everything and having really good firm hook sets as well. So there's my knot, there's my double uni knot and you can see the line starting to cover the mono and eventually it's just going to fill the whole reel. Alright, so now I'm at the second fundamental juncture in this rig, which is another double uni knot. This time going from my braid to the end of my setup, which is about a five or six foot length of 100% fluorocarbon leader material. I use 20 pound because it holds up pretty nicely to uh, Pike's teeth. I've, uh, I've reeled in many 10 pound plus Pike on 20 pound fluorocarbon and I have yet to be cut off by one. It's more than possible. 
And I do have an 80 pound fluorocarbon leader as well if I'm really expecting to be in big pike waters or musky. Uh, but this, this has always done the trick and it's a lot more stealthy than an 80 pound fluoro lead. Uh, which is quite visible underwater as opposed to the 20. Part of the reason that anglers like fluorocarbon leaders is because they are supposed to be relatively invisible underwater. Uh, I think they're supposed to have the same refraction index as water or something like that, so light bounces off it the same way. I don't really think that's true, it's probably just marketing garbage, but uh, it's got a lot less stretch than mono, so it's still nice for my hook sets. But it is very abrasion resistant, uh, not only to pike's teeth, but to rocks and twigs that you might snag. Uh, does a really good job holding up. On the very end of this rig, I've got a crankbait snap. Any crankbait snap will do. Uh, here's the size of it in comparison to my thumbnail. Um, these are great if you like switching lures often, as I do. If you're going with the same lure over and over and over, um, then you might want to tie just to the line, but the crankbait snap gives your crankbaits a nice action um, And it's and it's just nice if you want to switch lures. I attach the snap with an improved clinch knot um, The odd time I'll use a palomar knot, but uh, that's those knots that I've listed so far I don't know four or five of them. Those are probably the only knots that I use I'm gonna close off this video with uh, some little factoids that uh, I think uh, a fair number of anglers don't know, uh, maybe just beginners, but uh, even experienced anglers sometimes don't know these things. Never, always hook your lure when it's not in use into the keeper here. If you've ever wondered what this little circle here is for, that, that's where, where your hook goes to keep your lure there if you're not using it. A lot of people will hook it onto their guides. Um, that's not a good idea because you can damage your guide and then your line, which is going through the guide repetitively, um, is eventually gonna get frayed by that little nick. Uh, so make sure you keep these really smooth. Don't beat them up by keeping your hooks in there. If you don't have a, a keeper, some rods don't, it's better to use this part here, never in this part. Just a couple pieces of terminology as well. This piece here is called your bail arm, or you can just call it your bail. Um, I've found a lot of people don't know what that's called. Uh, and then your drag here, I've seen people who have fished for many years, very casually, um, not really understand what this is for. This controls how easily or, or hard uh, it is to pull line out of your reel. If I turn it clockwise, it's going to get really firm and it's going to be really hard to pull line out of there. If I turn it counterclockwise, line comes out very easily. And I know that's pretty 101, uh, but just FYI in case you're a more casual angler and you weren't sure. Another piece of reel terminology is the gear ratio. This Fluger Supreme is 6.2 to 1, which means that every time I crank the handle here one time around, this is rotating 6.2 times. An important thing with reels is to never get sand in them. If you have your rod and reel on a beach, Never lay it down in the sand. Always put it upright so only the butt end of your rod is touching the sand. Sand is horrible on this. It turns into like a pepper grinder, but for sand. Sand is just little rocks. Um, I saw a cool article recently. It was, it was this guy who multiplied or uh, magnified grains of sand by 300 times. They look like little rocks. Um, so they're hard. Don't get them in your reel. Another thing, if you're fighting a fish and you're hearing this, your drag is probably too loose. Tighten it up, unless that fish is just huge and it's going on a big run, that's one thing. If the, also, if the fish is fighting you, allow the rod to do the work there. Don't reel as the fish is fighting. Don't constantly reel, you wanna play the fish. Let the rod do the work when the fish is fighting against you. If the fish will come with you, that's when you're reeling down. If you're really not sure where to start with drag, if you just don't understand what I'm talking about, um, just tighten this up to a point where you can pull line out, but it's not super easy. You don't want it too light or too firm. Both of those are going to lose your fish. Next subject is doing your research. Gathering a little bit of information and intelligence on lakes that you plan to be traveling on your trip. 
Unlike a boater who may have a Navionics gold chip and have detailed bathymetry for a lake and know all the hot spots, they fish it repetitively. Paddlers are often going to new lakes they've never been on, they have no information, there may not be bathymetry or depth charts. And a little bit of information, having a little information as you go into the trip to visit these lakes can be massive just to help you find start points. This process doesn't need to be difficult at all. I'll show you how easy it can be using three resources on my cell phone right now. Finding bathymetry if possible, looking at structure on satellite, and trying to identify species using government information. So one simple place you can try and find information is Google Maps. If you go to satellite view, often on lakes you'll be able to identify structure for instance, here in Marathon on Penn Lake, you can see my, my points of interest on it. For instance, here I marked out the boundaries of the drop-off, so I can see where the depth changes. This is the only deep part on this lake. Often it's not going to be so evident on most lakes, but this is a very shallow lake, so it is. And then you can see here in the middle I've marked some weed beds as well in the shallow section of the lake. But really it's these deep pockets that I wanted to know. Then if I scroll down the highway to Rouse Lake, for instance, I can look at it and just try and find main lake structure like this point right here. Uh, somewhere I would try, it looks like there's an inflowing creek coming here. I can't tell if it's an inflow or outflow, but either way, um, I would check it out. If it's an inflow, that's awesome. Here's another one. I would try and fish both of those spots. A little point here as well. So things like this is where you can start with a lake. If you don't know if you don't know the lake, if you haven't fished it before, these are great places to start. Dissecting a lake can be a real challenge when you've never been there before, especially if it's a big lake. So you need some kind of starting point. And then once you if you find fish in these spots, you can start to develop patterns, which is one of the most important things. Are they on rocks? Are they on weed beds? Are they on a point, a wind blown point, things like that. So you got to start somewhere and this is a good place to do that. Another critical part of your pre-trip research should be trying to identify what species are going to be in the lakes you'll be fishing. So here in Ontario we have this wonderful app called Fish Online and I'm get, betting that a lot of, I know that a lot of governments, provincial, state governments, uh, territorial, offer a resource like this. So it shouldn't be horribly hard to find anymore. So here's Wolf Camp Lake, for instance. If I scroll down, uh, it'll tell me information on the lake. Actually, this one doesn't have much. Um, you'll have to forgive them because here in Ontario, we've got a quarter million lakes. So it's pretty hard to map them all in, in perfect detail. But I can see this one, for instance, is stocked with splake every, almost every year for the last four or five years uh, with thousands of splakes. So uh, if you're interested in splake, that's a good place to start. But then, not all lakes are stocked, of course, but uh, if they are just native fish species, this will often tell you what's in there. This one has brook trout, according to this resource, but it's right off the highway, so it's probably fished out, more or less. But let's see what's in Lake Superior, for instance. Just about everything you can imagine. And then there are even public reports of what they have caught. You got bowfin, chinooks, lake trout, etc. And then here on this lake, it does have good information on maximum depth, average depth, and so on. So knowing what species, if it's a walleye lake or if it's a, a largemouth bass lake, I'm going to fish so much differently. And knowing that going in before your trip is really essential. The third piece of pre-trip information I'll talk about is bathymetry or depth charts, depth maps lake contours um, go by several names i'm in the navionics app on my phone here there's also a, a web app which is free to access um, which shows pretty much the same information but uh, a lake this big like Na lake nipissing is very hard to dissect again if you've never been there similar to trying to find information on satellite view and trying to dissect a lake uh, Getting every bit of information you can is going to help you find somewhere to start with where you can start establishing a pattern on the fish for that particular day. Um, so in here in a 30 foot bay, there are some nice six, 10 foot shoals. Um, this could be a great place to start. And you can, you can look for a main lake structure that you could see on a satellite as well. 
but here you're going to get the underwater information that a satellite will usually not provide. Um, satellite sensors generally their uh, their wavelengths don't penetrate water, so when you when you see a lake and you see depth to the lake, it just shows up as black or dark blue. Uh, and you can't see through the water very deep at all. So that's the advantage of getting the bathymetry versus the satellite. If there's any species I value bathymetry for, it is lake trout, especially in the summer, trying to find deep basins, but also winter and, and much of the year, really. Uh, for instance, on a lake like this, lots of, of mid-depth, but then here in this corner of the lake, you've got the deepest basin, 130 feet plus. So I would probably try there first in the summer, but they could be cruising around the other bays. There's some nice 60 foot depths there as well. But um, if this was all, let's say every other bay was maxed out at 20, 30 feet, and this was the one basin of depth, uh, then that would be extremely valuable information to have to start dis dissecting this lake. The last subject pertains to catch and release. It's uh, not going to help you catch more fish as I mentioned, but it's extremely important. I think we've all injured a fish perhaps and, and released it and had a feeling it wasn't going to make it or it took too long to get the hook out and uh, the fish probably died as a result after it was released. This isn't good, it's not a good feeling, so uh, check out this clip and uh, just try to keep these things in mind as you're going out there and, and try to prepare as best you can to release that fish if you're going to, um, to give it the best chance at survival possible. I'm going to start out this video on fish handling tips by asking you to do something on the count of three. One, two, three, hold your breath. And just continue to hold your breath without getting any warning that you were going to need to while I describe tip number two. Tip number two is to use a rubberized basket shaped net. It's gentler on the fish, especially compared to non-rubberized nets that are made of a fabric. They really can really cut into the fish when they're thrashing around in it. And the basket shape is nice and supportive for the fish. If you're a typical person, you've had to breathe by now. Tip number one is to minimize the time the fish is out of the water. This is the most important part of fish handling. Always keep the fish in the water if you plan to release it. Just like you a moment ago, that fish isn't able to breathe and it certainly doesn't know to hold its breath when it's about to get hauled out of the water. The next time you've got a fish out of the water, pretend that you're a surgeon in an operating room. Every second counts and you have to be precise and careful. Like any good surgeon, you're also going to clean your hands before you handle the patient. In this case, that means just wetting your hands. Fish have a protective layer of slime and sometimes scales and your dry hands are very good at removing that, which is not good for the fish. So always wet your hand before you handle the fish. As a surgeon, something else you learned in medical school is to always keep your tools handy. You must that's handy. First of all is jaw spreaders. If you're fishing for pike or muskie in particular, these are essential to have. Don't get the ones that have a nasty spike on the end of them that kind of keeps them in place. Use rubberized ones with a flat area here. All you do is stick it in the pike's mouth It's not painful at all and it keeps the fish's mouth open while you go in there and pry out the lure. This little guy absolutely inhaled this. It's times like these you need the jaws of life. Jaw spreaders. And there we go. No harm. No foul. This little guy will be fine now, and without them, it would have been almost impossible to get that out. See you, dude. You don't always need this for pike and muskie, but if they're more deeply hooked, then you're going to need to. Just threw my tools down in some rabbit poo that I didn't notice. Depending how the fish is hooked and how deeply it's hooked, you may need different tools. I like one really long, Long nose plier like this, it's got a fine little mouth on the end which is quite precise for grabbing the lure back there. This is a great one for, for pike and muskie in particular. And then for most other fish I use hemostats, one's fairly large and then one's just a regular size. You can use pliers too but these are nice and lightweight for backcountry travel. Tip number five is something you do before you even get in the boat and that's reduce the number of hooks on your lure and pinch a lot of your barbs. This is essential for a successful catch and release. I often remove the front hook. I find the back one to be perfectly sufficient. Uh, sometimes I'll keep both but clip one hook 
off of each treble to make the, a tandem, which is almost equally effective. And then just get a pair of regular pliers and pinch the barbs. It makes it so much easier to remove them from the fish's mouth. If you plan on releasing the fish, it's really a much more enjoyable experience for you. For you. You'll spend a lot less time getting the hooks out and you'll have less of that grief that you may feel if you're compassionate uh, when you're removing the hooks from the fish. Tip number six is do not fish deeper than 30 feet of water. For many species, if you catch them in more than 30 feet of water, the change in pressure causes their organs to expand in a process called barotrauma. Humans can also experience it, scuba divers, for instance. And not only will this almost certainly kill the fish, but it's got to be just an excruciating way to go. Some species, like lake trout for instance, are not affected by barotrauma. They have the ability to burp air out of their air bladder, through their gut, and out which allows them to release the pressure. But generally I would just avoid fishing deeper than 30 feet. The last tip pertains to a fish that you intend to keep. If you're going to keep a fish, dispatch it immediately by clubbing it on the back of the head so that you take out the brain instantaneously. Thank you my friend, thank you. I give them a good number of wax just to make sure they're dead. And I know how inhumane it seems, but I'm really trying to minimize its suffering. Thank you, my friend. If you absolutely must keep the fish alive because you're worried about spoilage, it's a hot day, whatever, uh, at least keep the fish in a live well. They're not my favorite, but they're a hell of a lot better than a stringer. Overall, just treat the fish as respectfully as you can. You're a lot bigger than it, a lot smarter than it, so try and show some humility. And lastly, if you're out with your buddies and you see them handling the fish in a bad way, say something. I think this applies more to men than to women, but when guys get together to fish or hunt, there's a tendency for the macho attitudes to come out and suddenly guys are just chucking their fish back into the water or just not showing any respect. Treating a fish badly doesn't make you a man and treating a fish with compassion doesn't make you a woman. Compassion is never a bad thing, so let's make sure we give that to our fish. They give so much to us. If you made it this far, I know it was pretty long. There's a lot to say. Uh, I want to thank you for, for listening, and I want to thank Quinn for, for inviting me to be a part of this and for putting this expo on. I hope these, these tips and this information helps you have better fishing experiences for you and, and for your fish, and that you have some great trips and fishing trips this year. Cheers.